closing arguments have been delayed in the trial of the man accused of killing a Toronto police officer. We'll have the latest on the Umar Zamir trial. More than 800 airline food staff at Pearson Airport, they have gone on strike. Here is a live look, potentially leaving thousands of passengers without meals. And it is federal budget day. The Trudeau government will unveil its new fiscal plan this afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to CP24 Live at Noon. I'm Bakari Savage. And I'm Lena Latifat. Thanks for joining us. We begin at the airport. Airline catering workers at Pearson, they are on the picket lines today. And that's where we find CP24's Courtney Hills at the Gate Gourmet facility. This is where workers are striking. And Courtney, we're hearing the words contingency plans. Yeah, that's right. I mean, many of these major airliners who receive food through the caterer say they have been planning for some time in case there was strike action. And we can also tell you these airlines are in communication with their passengers, really saying we have plans in place, but it's also a good idea to pack a snack. It really just depends on how long your flight will be. We'll start with the actual strike action behind me here. So about 800 workers here in Mississauga with Gate Gourmet, they walked off the job because they say they're not happy with the latest offer from their employer. Many of them telling me, wages a big issue here. I'm hearing from people who say they've worked for the company for many, many years. In some cases, they're only making between $17 and $20 an hour, and they say that doesn't address the cost of living they're dealing with right now. The company's saying they're putting a reasonable offer on the table, Gate Gourmet offering them a 12% raise over the next three years. Here's more from workers who I talked to this morning saying why this deal doesn't work for them. We are doing a hard job. So few of the people are working since 35 years, 40 years they're here. So everyone needs a, some, some kind of benefit from the company so that we can live our life peacefully here and with at least a, a wage by which we can survive. And we want the fair wages for everybody, equal fair treatment, you know, and then that's why everybody's out. Are you hoping that a better offer will come to the table for you guys? Yeah. That's why we all are here. We are supporting, we are all together. We are contributing ourselves to uh, give, it, uh, give a message that we are supporting each other and they should listen to us. Here's what Gate Gourmet is saying this afternoon about straight action. Uh, they're sharing a statement. It reads in part, our operations across Canada and globally remain unaffected and our commitment to delivering high quality service to our airline customers continues. At our operation in Toronto, we have established contingency plans with our airline customers to minimize any impact on them and their passengers. Many of the union workers on strike tell me this strike is going to impact uh, food delivery and service on airlines because these people are responsible for cooking the food, packing it up and delivering it to flights over at Pearson. Some of the major airlines here too, we're talking about Air Canada and WestJet. Air Canada says their international flights not really affected by the strike, but they are saying shorter flights around two hours. You're only looking at basic snacks like pretzels and cookies, maybe some water. And what we're hearing from WestJet, they say for longer flights, you would receive a voucher ahead of getting on board the flight. But again, the message there, plan ahead and maybe pack a snack just in case. Over to you guys. All right, Courtney Hughes, thanks so much. Lynx Air says a firm that was con contracted to handle bookings is refusing to help with passenger reimbursement. The locals carrier shut down and filed for creditor protection in February. Lynx says that it's been forced to work with its credit card processor to deal with charges for would-be travelers whose flights were canceled. The airline says in court filings that Texas-based Sabre Corporation's refusal to help will result in big fees for Lynx, which will ultimately be to the detriment of investors hoping to recoup some of their money. Now to the court. Closing arguments have been delayed in the trial of Umar Zamir. Last week, Zamir took the stand in his own defense, testifying he and his wife feared for their lives the night Constable Jeffrey Northrup and his partner, who were dressed in plain clothes, approached their vehicle in the underground parking garage below City Hall. The Crown has argued Zamir made a series of maneuvers with his vehicle that led to Northrop's death. Zamir has pleaded not guilty to first-degree murder. And criminal defense lawyer Joseph Newberger says the Crown is in a tough position ahead of closing arguments. There was evidence that was brought in by uh, at least one or two officers who dealt with Mr. Zamir right upon his arrest. There was spontaneous utterances of him not knowing these were police officers and wanting to flee and obviously being in a state of confusion and fear. That's important. And um, his apologies are extremely important because this is clearly a very significant tragedy. 
We have the death of an officer, a veteran officer who was in pursuit of what he thought was a suspect. Police officers are very vulnerable when, when in their duty. And his expressing appropriate remorse for his actions that resulted in his death, but not saying that I intentionally did it, but it was an accident and I'm extremely sorry about this. Well, Toronto police are set to announce arrest in a recent investigation into carjacking. CB24's Beatrice Faisman is previewing that update in front of police headquarters this afternoon. Beatrice. Lena, good afternoon. We're going to be hearing from Toronto Police coming up at 1 o'clock this afternoon at headquarters. So in an hour's time, we'll hear from Superintendent Annie Singh from 31 Division, along with uh, Inspector Mattis from the Holdup Squad. The fact that uh, Superintendent Singh is here from 31, uh, I imagine, generally suggests, Lena and Bakari, that the arrests happen specifically in that division in our city. That's up near uh, Jane and Driftwood area, just for reference to our viewers up in North York. When it comes to carjackings, I mean, we know how big of a problem uh, uh, carjackings and auto thefts have become not only in our city but right across the province. The numbers they speak for themselves. It was a month ago that we heard from Police Chief Myron Demke with the latest stats. And in the first uh, three months of uh, this year, the chief telling us the city already seeing more than double the number of carjackings it did compared to the same time last year. So the stats that were released a month ago uh, suggesting between January 1st and the middle of March, uh, there were 68 carjackings. That was a 106% increase over the same time period the previous year. Uh, and it comes after it just keeps increasing year over year. The chief saying uh, during that press conference that 34 vehicles in the city of Toronto are stolen every single day. What does that equal? That uh, it equals, in fact, that 40, every 40 minutes there's a car being stolen in the city of Toronto. So again, coming up at 1 o'clock, uh, we'll hear from Superintendent Annie Singh and uh, the inspector from the holdup squad about what this latest investigation entails, how many arrests have been made, and uh, how many vehicles, if any, have been recovered. We know the Port of Montreal has really become a sore spot, and we also saw a cards jacking task force being uh, formed across the province as well to help tackle this issue. So we'll have a lot of questions for the superintendent and the inspector. That press conference coming up at 1 o'clock. All right, we'll keep an eye out for that. Beatrice Faisman reporting live. Thanks so much, Beatrice. Data cloud company Snowflake has officially opened opened a new office in Toronto. And Premier Ford and Mayor Chow, they were among those who cut the ribbon on the massive 52,000 square foot space at 16 York Street. The new office highlights the company's investment in Toronto's tech community and its dedication to advancing cutting edge data and AI technologies. Focusing on AI, your company, fintech, e-commerce, cybersecurity, retail technology, and advanced networks. We're now home to one of the largest IT clusters in North America, as you mentioned again, Stephen. In fact, these are pretty staggering numbers. In fact, the San Francisco Bay Area employs about 388,000 people in their tech sector whereas we employ over 425,000 people and we're growing 350% faster than the Bay Area. Of course, you could have selected a better city. We are the third biggest, other than New York and Los Angeles, right? We have, uh, a, we are the leading jurisdiction for data science and tech innovation, you know that. We're working hard to build a reputation of our world-class world -class talent and expertise. You saw that in us. Thank you. And Snowflake first landed in Canada in 2022, choosing Toronto for one of its five global engineering hubs. This year, the company is on track to double its team in the city. And coming up next on CP24 Live and New. Today's federal budget day. We're going to be joined by political strategists of all stripes next to preview it. The Trudeau government is going to unveil its federal budget this afternoon. We are going to check in with political strategist and founding partner at Canaptus. Jamie Ellerton, and he's held positions with the federal conservatives and provincial PCs. Jamie, it's good to sit down with you. Thank you for joining us, and happy budget day. <laughs> Thanks, Lena. Great to be back in studio. <laughs> I, I know that's a big thing in the world of politics. Um, there is a, a really big emphasis on housing here. The federal government doling out billions of dollars to try and make 
affordable housing a reality for so many Canadians. What are you watching for? What are your expectations? So I honestly think all the actual big news of this budget is already out. I think the Trudeau government looks at how budgets in previous years have gone over. It's barely 48 hours in the news cycle. So they've actually quite effectively, I think, over the past three weeks, been rolling out big announcement after big announcement to get more mileage for the money they're trying to spend. Okay, so you just said no news budget. What is your biggest criticism here? Uh, I think when you look at kind of where the federal budget's at, there's clearly no path back to balance. There's never been one under this Trudeau government. And so you hear the headline today, like they're going to raise taxes on the wealthiest 1%. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really more of a soundbite to generate that headline. It's not going to give real revenue to coffers to bring that budget into balance. And when I think when you look at how Pierre and the Conservative Party have been, frankly, really framing the narrative on the federal scene right now, you're starting to see the Trudeau liberals try and pick fights with premiers because they'd rather argue with them when Pierre is currently dominating so much of the conversation. But I think ultimately for the Liberals right now, budget's like the first step in the process. They actually need to follow through over the next 18 months and show real results because Canadians right now are just tuning them out. They don't believe them. When it comes to people in the GTA, I mean, there's a real affordability crisis here. There's a housing crisis here. What do you think people in our neck of the woods are, are, are wanting from this budget? So for, need? I think for some, like they're looking at some of the housing measures and hoping that additional supply is going to help. Uh, you've seen in concert with, frankly, the provincial government here, the removal of HST off purpose-built rentals, which yeah. is going to spur more rental supply. But you know how long it takes to build up a tower in this city. If you say you want to do it today, you're probably looking at three years minimum before that, that real supply comes online. So people are looking for affordability relief. Uh, and from what we've heard from the government so far, it doesn't look like it's coming. And Jamie, what about the vulnerable population and the indigenous? I just like, again, I think when you look at what this government's announced, there's always the big photo op. There's always the spending announcement, but this government lacks the follow through. And I think when you look at what they've been trying to position, there might be a few million here, a few million there. Even take their good news announcement of trying to have an affordable lunch program for students. Only 400,000 students are going to benefit from that. When you look at child poverty levels, that's not going to be enough. So they're trying to do so many things, but they're doing none of it well. And I think until they start to focus, you're not going to see that political calculus change. I, I want to talk about the politics of all of this. What is at stake here for the Trudeau Liberals? So I think what you've seen with their pre-budget rollout, which again, I do actually think has been quite effective in framing the narrative, mm -hmm. they've actually given themselves a fighting chance to kind of take some of that spotlight away from Pierre Polyev. And that fight they're having with the premiers on these issues is a way for them to, again, change the channel and kind of suck up the oxygen so that on CP24, they're talking about Justin Trudeau and Doug Ford going at it and kind of trying to crowd out Pierre Polyev. When you look at what they're doing on the more progressive side of the ledger with, again, this announcement today that there's going to be a wealth in tax, uh, sorry, a wealth tax increase for the wealthiest 1 percent, they're trying to steal some of that and thunder from Jagmeet Singh and the NDP to maintain their center left coalition. So when you look at how the liberals are obviously down in the polls, everyone knows that they're really struggling. What I've seen from the Liberals in the past month is they've finally woken up to that reality and they're giving themselves a fighting chance for an election that's 18 months away to be a serious contender because Justin Trudeau says he's not going anywhere. The okay. question is, is it too late for that? We'll, we'll find out, I guess. Uh, Jamie Ellerton, thanks so much for your time. Good thanks, to sit down with Okay, for the NDP perspective on today's federal budget. We're now joined live by former MPP and VP at Crestview Strategy, Gurathan Singh. Uh, Gurathan, great to see you and thank you for joining us. We were just sort of listening to the conservative perspective. What do you think about what is about to be tabled today? So what I think about what's likely to come forward, let's look at the announcements that we've seen already in the news. I think the NDP has really demonstrated their ability to get results for Canadians because we know that the announcements that the Liberals have made around this uh, food program for kids, the availability of, of diabetes medication and devices and birth control, when we look at the investments in affordable housing that we see coming forward, the dental care program, all of this has really been because of the NDP. So the NDP has really demonstrated their commitment to working for Canadians. That being said, when we see a lot of these housing promises that have been made by the Liberals, it's true. I think a lot of Canadians don't really believe them. And this is being perceived as too little too late, because if they were really serious about housing, it would have been done years ago, these investments and these announcements, rather than now the 11th hour. That being said, I think the alternative of Pierre Polyev and the Conservatives is not what Canadians need right now. Uh, I want to remind viewers that when he was Minister of Housing, we lost a million affordable homes that were under the purview of the federal government. So I don't think that's the solution either. We know he, he would go after a lot of these social services that we need. So I think this is a little bit of what we'll see in this, uh, potentially see in this uh, upcoming budget today. Okay. And you mentioned results. 
Give me one missed opportunity here. I, I can give you a lot more than one. The really big missed opportunity in this budget is the fact that this is, should have been a budget from four or five years ago. The Liberal government only now, when their numbers have dropped to really historic lows, when we see uh, a huge amount of dissatisfaction for the Liberal government, are we actually seeing finally, when the House is on fire, the Liberals are now trying to throw pails of water to put it out. And it is, I believe, far too little too late. And I think that's the, the huge missed opportunity is not meeting Canadians where they were being proactive in addressing this issue years ago. Uh, Gurathan, you live in the GTA. You know what it's like to deal with these housing prices, these grocery prices. Um, is there anything in the way of affordability measures that you're really hoping for here? So once again, I think the really key affordable things that are concrete, those around diabetes medication and for devices, those around uh, birth control, those around um, this uh, food program for, for kids, you know, dental care, these are affordable affordability issues and these are largely directly wins from the NDP pressuring and pushing the Liberal government to bring these wins for uh, everyday individuals and everyday folks. But on the issues that are also really a huge stress for people right now, be it grocery prices or the, the, bill, the bills of uh, phone bills or other kind of bills that they're facing, I, I'm pretty skeptical that we're going to see anything in this budget that's going to really directly address those factors on a factor that, frankly, is probably one of the highest point of concern right now, those being grocery bills and those day-to-day -day expenses that people are dealing with. Okay, Gurathan Singh, former NDP MPP and VP at Crestview Strategy. Good to get your thoughts. Thank you for this. Much love. Always a pleasure. Okay, now let's bring in a liberal voice to look ahead to today's budget. And for that, we turn to Mitzi Hunter, former liberal MPP. Great to see you. Uh, thanks for joining us and happy budget day. What are you watching for in this budget? Yeah, great to be here. First of all, in this budget, Canadians will know exactly where their tax dollars are going. I believe the government has done an excellent job in the lead up to the budget in explaining where the investments are going to go, where the priorities are. And if you think back on previous budgets, can you even remember what the program spending was? Yet this time around, the Liberals really doubled down on communicating the things that were really uh, top of mind for Canadians, like housing affordability, uh, the economy, where it's going, new things like AI and how we're going to make sure that Canadians are making a, a massive play in those areas. And I, I think that, you know, today's budget is going to be good news. Uh, we're going to see very, very practical things that helps with affordability, but we're also seeing very big ideas that speaks to the future of Canada. Okay, let's bring this down to a municipal level, right? Just a couple blocks away from here, John, or, you know, right there um, at the corner, John. we saw the issue with the refugees and how the onus of this was put on the black churches. Let's talk about that in the budget. Yeah, Bakari, I really appreciate you speaking to that because that was a shameful moment I felt for us as Canadians that, you know, people are here as asylum seekers, refugees, and end up sleeping on the streets, not just for one night, but for weeks and, and going into months. And the churches had to step in to, to really put the spotlight on the affordable housing crisis, on the fact that we don't have enough shelter space, and that, you know, this is unacceptable for Canadians. Canadians. And we had to do something. So it, in a way, kick-started uh, the impetus for governments at all levels to do something about this. And, and I do see that the City of Toronto, in its strategy, is leaning into those who are chronically unhoused, making sure that they, they get housing. So, so does that mean that you're saying you want to see more money for uh, asylum seekers in the city and for housing in the city. Let's talk about Toronto. What, what do you hope Toronto walks away with at the end of the day? Yeah, well, Toronto has put forward a very ambitious housing strategy. It's six, a $65 billion strategy, the full spectrum of housing, which includes temporary shelters that are needed to make sure people are not sleeping on the street. But also it includes family housing and housing that, you know, people who are working in the city can afford to live in the city. And affordable housing is really super important. And it's not just um, the, the units of housing. It's also the mix. 
and making sure that we have things like multiplex housing, building in the density. Toronto is not getting any bigger from a land perspective, so we have to add density around transit stations, having making sure that we intensify those locations and uh, and build as much housing. So, so is as that possible. is that a yes? Then you're hopeful that there will be new money for Toronto's refugee crisis and housing crisis. Then. Absolutely. We need more investments for sure, but we also need to help the city meet its ambitious housing okay. targets so that we have housing across the spectrum of housing need in the city, including renters. And that's a, a really key part. 50% of the people in this city are renters, so we need to make sure that there's housing available for them and that we're not okay. seeing people, you know, renovicted out of their housing, but actually we preserve affordable housing in this city. That has to be a priority. Okay. okay, Mitzi Hunter, former Liberal MPP, thanks so much for your time. Thank we you appreciate this. Me. Yeah, thank you very much. And coming up next on CP24 Live at noon, we're going to go live to Turkey and get an update on the rising tensions in the Middle East. Israel is vowing to respond to the Iranian missile strike over the weekend. And CTV National's Adrian Gobriel joins us live from Istanbul, Turkey, with the latest on tensions in the region. What more can you tell us, Adrian? Well, the question of the hour here in the region is how will Israel respond to Iran's attack over the weekend? Uh, there are reports out of the United States tonight that they could see, uh, we could see a limited Israeli response, though they could target a location within Iran. Now, what that might look like is still anyone's guess. There's plenty of speculation happening. You know, for years, we've seen a bit of shadow warfare taking place. Could we see a cyber attack? Or potentially, could we see Israel try and uh, 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 focus in on one of the bases for inside Iran, where part of that airstrike took place over the weekend. Again, it's speculation at this hour, though the hours ahead and the days ahead are certainly going to be interesting to watch. And we know, Adrian, that Iran has promised to respond in kind as well. And Iran saying that this time its response will be severe. So this back and forth, I mean, this could just be the beginning. Yeah, definitely. And, and that is really the concern in the wider region. I'm in Istanbul today and speaking with people here, there is a real concern about a wider regional war, the likes of which we've really never seen before. Uh, you know, dating back to October 7th, uh, when, when Hamas went into Israel, there's been plenty of speculation, a discussion about the possibility of a wider regional war, war. But now it seems more plausible, more plausible than ever. And one of the other concerns here in the region is that neither side has shown an ability to concede, and therein lies the danger. And also, Adrian, how could a wider regional war in the Middle East impact Canada? Well, the, in multiple ways, there's economic implications, diplomatic implications. And simply put, if Israel responds in force and Iran does as well, then Canada, the U.S. and other allies are going to have a difficult time avoiding being dragged further in to this escalating conflict. Okay, and can you tell us more about Canada's position? We heard from Foreign Affairs Minister uh, Melanie Jolie uh, yesterday. She asked Israel to take the win and urged Benjamin Netanyahu not to retaliate. Yeah, and that wind that they're speaking about is the fact that, you know, the U.S. and Canada, as we heard from Melanie Jolie, our Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, they're calling uh, Israel's uh, uh, successful defense of Iran's offensive over the weekend a victory. And they're asking Israel to look at that as a win and to, to use their, their heads and not just their hearts as they plan uh, their next move in the days and weeks ahead. And I know these things are, are hard to time out, obviously, but any sense of when Israel might strike back? Yeah, at this time, there hasn't been. There have been reports from different news outlets that a, a response could be happening, uh, uh, you know, any, a, imminent, an imminent response could be taking place, though there's been no confirmation yet from the IDF. And so really right now, this entire region is simply hanging on by the thinnest of threads. Wow. Okay, CTV's Adrian Gobriel live from Istanbul, Turkey. Thank you. And coming up next on CB24 Live at Noon, we're live at the airport where air catering workers are on the picket lines today. We'll tell you how that is impacting travelers when we come back. Stay with us.
And closing arguments have been delayed in the trial of the man accused of killing a Toronto police officer. We're going to have the latest on the Umar Zamir trial coming up. More than 800 airline food service staff at Pearson Airport, they're on strike, potentially leaving thousands of passengers without in-flight meals. And today is federal budget day. The Trudeau government is going to unveil its new fiscal plan this afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to CB24 Live at Noon. I'm Lena Latifat. And I'm Bakari Savage. Airline catering workers at Pearson Airport, they are on the picket lines today. CB24's Courtney Heels is at the Gate Gourmet facility. That is where workers are striking. Uh, tell us more about the sticking points, Courtney. Well, the big sticking point here, Lena and Bakari, wages. We're hearing from people who work here at this facility. They're responsible for cooking food, packing it up, and delivering it to airlines out of Pearson Airport. They don't feel the latest offer from their employer is reasonable. Many of them telling me they've worked here for several years, and they're making between $17 and $20 an hour. Uh, you can see many still out on the picket lines. They walked off the job just after midnight. The two sides have been negotiating, and we're hearing from Gate Gourmet saying they offered their employees a 12% raise over the next three years. But people here say that offer isn't good enough. They say it really doesn't address the cost of living crisis they're dealing with. Here's more. We're working out a job because the company is not meeting our demands. We have 13 good days negotiation and it, it, it didn't get, end up anywhere. The company is trying to say we don't have money, we don't have money. Our members are suffering, okay? We need a benefit enhancement, we need sick days, we need better pay, we need better wages. Our people are suffering. We can't even feed, people can't feed our family. They can't feed our family because, simply because people have been working here for over 20 years. And guess what? Do you know how much they're making? Less than $20. Over 20 years. It's shameful. Here's what Gate Gourmet has to say about the strike action by its employees. They released a statement. It reads in part, our operations across Canada and globally remain unaffected and our commitment to delivering high quality service to our airline customers continues. Our operation in Toronto, at our operation in Toronto, we have established contingency plans with our airline customers to minimize any impact on them and their passengers. The union members tell me that there will be an impact for people flying out of Pearson Airport when it comes to access to food, drinks, snacks. And we are hearing that from some of the airlines too. Uh, they provide for some of the major airlines as well, guys. So we're talking about Air India, Air Canada, WestJet. Air Canada telling people international flights, a food service won't be affected. But when it comes to snacks for short flights, so around two hours, you're really only looking at basic stuff like pretzels and water. Uh, WestJet providing vouchers depending on where the flight is going and how long it will be. Also advising people to pack a snack. Over to you. Okay, and again, pack that snack. CP24's Courtney Hills live at Pearson Airport and continuing our conversation on air travel. Lynx Air says that a firm that was contracted to handle bookings is refusing to help with passenger reimbursement. The low-cost carrier shut down and filed for creditor protection in February. Lynx says it's been forced to work with its credit card processor to deal with charges for would-be travelers whose flights were canceled. The airline says in court filings that a Texas-based Sabre Corporation's refusal to help will result in big fees for Lynx that will ultimately be to the detriment of investors hoping to recoup some of their money. And closing arguments have been delayed in the trial of Umar Zamir. Last week, Zamir took the stand in his own defense, testifying that he and his wife feared for their lives. The night, Constable Jeffrey Northrup and his partner, who were dressed in plain clothes, approached their vehicle in the underground parking garage below City Hall. The Crown has argued that Zamir made a series of maneuvers with his vehicle, which led to Northrup's death. Zamir has pleaded not guilty to first-degree murder. And criminal defense lawyer Joseph Newberger says that the Crown's in a tough position ahead of closing arguments. Sometimes in life, there's a constellation of facts that come together where tragic things happen, but it doesn't mean it's criminal. And I think the Crown has a very significant hurdle in establishing first-degree murder. I think the only thing that's at play here is manslaughter or an outright acquittal. And, and I, I think based on the evidence thus far, it's leaning towards an acquittal, but you never know what a jury will do. And of course, we weren't listening to every piece of evidence as the jury was. Also making news, Toronto police are set to announce arrests in a recent investigation into carjackings. And CP24's Beatrice Vaisman is previewing that update in front of police headquarters. Beatrice. 
But Kari, at one o'clock this afternoon, so in just uh, less than half an hour now, we're going to be hearing from Superintendent Andy Singh along with uh, Inspector Mattis from the Hold Up Squad. Uh, when it comes to uh, one of the most recent carjacking investigations and arrests, the reason that Superintendent Singh is here uh, is because this is uh, an investigation that's centered around North York. CP24 has learned that it was officers from 31 Division who actually made the arrests in this carjacking investigation. By the way, for any reference for people up watching us, Seth, 31 division is up at uh, Finch and the 400. But again, this is a North York investigation. What are uh, carjackings? They are different than auto thefts because carjackings involve uh, some type of crime or violence happening uh, in the midst of a, an auto theft. Uh, we heard from Chief Myron Demke just a month ago when he was delivering the latest stats during the Toronto Police Services Board. He said that one car is stolen here in the city of Toronto every 40 minutes and that up till March, uh, the latest carjacking stats uh, show that there were a 106% rise in carjackings in 2014 in the first three months of this year compared to 2023. Well, I can share with you some of the latest stats provided to CP24 by Toronto Police, and it shows that between January 1st and April 15th of this year, uh, there have been a total of 97 carjackings in the city of Toronto. Compare that to 46 carjackings in the same window last year. So more than double rise this year compared to last year, Bakari and Lena. And we already know last year saw more carjackings and auto thefts than 2022 and 22 saw more than 21. So it's a growing threat, uh, trend happening here in the city. Uh, the good news, and I, let's just say the silver lining, I've just been told by Toronto Police that auto thefts specifically, so these are non-violent crimes, are actually down 14% this year compared to 2023. But again, carjackings more than double and home invasions, I'm told, up as well. So one o'clock, we'll share live with our viewers this press conference from Toronto Police. Back to you. All right, Beatrice Faceman report live. Thanks so much for this fee. One person has been arrested following a fail to remain collision near King City. We're going to give you a live shot of the scene from Chopper 24 now over the scene at York Vaughn Road and Dufferin Street. Uh, several police vehicles here, including from both York Regional Police and the OPP. Police say a vehicle hit another car and the driver tried to flee, but the scene flee the scene, but was later taken into custody. You can see it's quite an active scene on the ground there. One person has minor injuries. That investigation continues. Keep it here on CB24 for the very latest. And after weeks of budget-related announcements, the Trudeau government is going to unveil its latest fiscal plan this afternoon. Finance Minister Krista Freeland kept up with the tradition of buying new pair of shoes for the budget announcement, choosing a pair of Meguiar heels branded as fair and accessible. That's what they're calling their budget. The government has already been unveiling significant planks of the budget over the last few weeks with a large focus on housing. The Liberals say the budget will be about giving hope to younger Canadians who have come of age during a tumultuous economic era. And there's a lot of political reaction already. Federal Conservative Party leader Pierre Polyev was on Parliament Hill early this morning going on the offensive when it comes to the Liberals' budget announcement. The good news is life wasn't like this before Justin Trudeau, and it won't be like this after he's gone. We're going to restore the country that we knew and still love, where hard work pays off, where government is the servant and not the master, where government is the servant and not the master of the people, where hard work means an affordable home and food in a safe neighborhood. This is the country to which we can look forward. This is the country that common sense will build. At an event this morning, Mayor Olivia Chow was asked about her wish list for the federal budget. I hope we can see in this budget uh, the housing and the, the funding to feed children. Uh, I'm optimistic it's, uh, that it would happen. I also hope there are infrastructure funds in there so that we could uh, make sure the roads, the transit, the child care centre, the library and the community centres are all there as we grow the city. So Finance Minister Krista Freeland, who's also the Deputy Prime Minister, she's expected to present the budget around 4 p.m. in the House of Commons. It's going to be a busy afternoon. CB24 will have continuing coverage throughout the day and evening. So stay here for that. And the annual inflation rate had ticked higher in March. That's compared with February. Boosted by higher prices for gasoline. 
Stats Canada says its consumer price index for March was up 2.9 percent compared with a year ago, up from a 2.8 percent year-over-year increase in February. Gas prices rose 4.5 percent compared with a year earlier. Stats Canada says mortgage interest costs rose 25.4 percent on a year-over-year basis and rent prices increased 8.5 percent. A data cloud company, Snowflake, has officially opened a new Toronto office. Premier Ford and Mayor Child, they were among those to cut the ribbon on the massive 52,000 square foot space at 16 York Street. The new office highlights the company's investment in Toronto's tech community and its dedication to advancing cutting edge data and AI technologies. We're investing up to $107 million to help Ontario companies adopt, develop, and bring to market critical technologies such as 5G, AI, blockchain, cybersecurity, and robotics. In 2018, we provided more than $19 million to support over 40 AI research projects at Ontario universities right across the province. And we're developing the workforce of the future. Workers you need to grow and expand. And I think you've taken us up on that offer because you're growing and, and expanding right here in Toronto and Ontario. You will also notice that we have a strong tech ecosystem of the academia, the startups, the businesses, the incubators, the accelerators, all coming together. And this announcement today will solidify Toronto's place as a home for forward thinking research in data and tech, a place where everyone can found a tech startup dream about it, have confidence, and learn, thank you, and come together to build the new digital tools for people and business. Snowflake first landed in Canada in 2022, choosing Toronto for one of its five global engineering hubs. This year, the company is on track to double its team in Toronto. Well, a group of doctors say that Canadian cancer screening guidelines set by a national task force is actually putting people at risk. They say national screening guidelines for breast, prostate, lung and cervical cancer con conflict with the opinions of specialists in those areas. The Canadian Task Force on Preventative Health Care recommends against the widespread use of PSA tests for early detection of prostate cancer. But prostate cancer specialists say they see too many patients dying because of delayed diagnosis. The task force says it weighs the benefits of screening against the harms of false positives. And coming up next on TV24, live at noon, this is a live look at the University of Toronto campus. This is where the cherry blossoms are in bloom. We're going to talk to the city of Toronto next about how they are preparing for cherry blossoms at Hyde Park. Stick around. Well, we are dealing with some major problems for the afternoon drive. Uh, there are issues happening on the northbound lanes of the 427. Is on the ramp uh, that takes you to Dixon. No access to that ramp. Had a vehicle go into the ditch. So uh, this is creating delays for commuters that usually use this exit ramp. If you're trying to get through the area, it's already slow and backed up on two of the 401. Good news on the westbound 401 in the collectors at Young. We were dealing with a collision that had the right lane blocked. That problem cleared, so that's why there's a bit of a bottleneck on that side. And on the Don Valley Parkway, a pretty jam cell bound as you make your way from Eglinton. Continue slow uh, to just south of Don Mills or approaching uh, Bayview Bloor. You find the right lane block. This overhead sign was struck earlier this morning. Uh, they're doing repairs to that sign. So that is the reason for the delay and the holdup. I'll send it back to you, Lena Bakari. The CP24 traffic report is brought to you by CapitalDirect.ca. Well, the cherry blossoms in High Park are expected to bloom right on schedule next week. And for more on what Toronto residents would expect, we are joined live by Natish Basono, Senior Communications Advisor with the City of Toronto. So it is that time of year, cherry blossom season. This always attracts a lot of people. How's the city preparing? Well, we're prepared as always. You know, we're looking at tens of thousands of people that are expected to visit not just High Park, but have over a dozen locations across the city. And so a lot of people don't realize that there is more than one location to go see these beautiful trees. You know, locations such as Edwards Garden uh, Exhibition Place, the John P. Robarts Research Library, Trinity Bellwoods, and even the University of Toronto's Scarborough campus, just to name a few. 
And so right now we're in stage four, which means, um, you know, we're at least six to 10 days before we reach the final stage, six, uh, stage six. Uh, and that's going to happen in about, uh, in, in some parts of the city very soon. So if you're looking to check out some of these, uh, these beautiful trees, the city of Toronto has a wonderful uh, breakdown of the locations. And our friends over at the High Park Nature Center actually have a really cool interactive map. So you can actually see at what stage some of these parks are at this point in time. And we're just taking a live shot of some of the beautiful cherry blossoms in our city. Of course, they're expected to bloom, re reach full bloom next week. Still looking very beautiful this week, though. Foot traffic, Natish, that's always a really big thing. So much so that you've had to now shut down any vehicular traffic in High Park. Can you talk about what it takes to plan for that? Absolutely. So the goal is always to create the safest experience possible, um, not just for people visiting, but also for the trees itself. And so we know that High Park is a very uh, busy area. We know that at this time of the year, it does attract a high volume of vehicles. And so the goal this year is to make it vehicle free. What we're trying to do actually is restrict vehicle access as of April 22nd, okay. with the exception of TTC wheel trans vehicles. And so what we want to do there is ensure that, one, people can take public transit because a lot of these parks are accessible. Uh, and two, we want to really also uh, keep the trees in mind as well. You know, as we see more vehicles, we see more pollution that has a negative impact on the ecosystem in and around Hyde Park. And Tish, what about those people trying to get that perfect photo? Are there any restrictions? Is there anything you want to say to people? Yeah. You know, obviously you're going to go there for the gram, but uh, <laughs> yeah. it really is to respect the trees. Um, you know, a lot of people don't notice, but there is a uh, history rooted in friendship with these trees. They were a gift to us uh, from Japan. Uh, they were gifted to us in 1959, um, you know, as a, as a token of appreciation for all the Japanese Canadians that are relocated after the Second World War. And so these symbols, these beautiful symbols of friendship, we want them to last for generations to come. And so what we're asking res re residents and visitors especially is that, uh, you know, if you're visiting these trees, to so please stay on the trails and the pavement to make sure you're not climbing the trees, that you're not trying to remove any of the blossoms. And if you are visiting these parks, to please use the designated bins for litter and recycling. Yeah, got to respect these beautiful trees. That's such an important message. And Nitesh Bassono, Senior Communications Advisor with the City of Toronto, thanks so much for this. Yeah, thanks a lot, Nitesh, and don't climb the trees. <laughs> don't climb the trees. Thank you. Coming up next on CB24 Live at Noon, we'll have much more on today's headlines, including this. All eyes will be on Austin Matthews and his quest for 70 goals when the Leafs take on the Panthers in Florida tonight. And what appears to be a first-round matchup, the Leafs battle the Panthers tonight in Florida. But all eyes are going to be on Austin Matthews and his quest for 70 goals. Matthews has been named the NHL's first star of the week. The Leafs superstar scored five goals in four games. He also extended his goal streak to eight games and his point streak to 14 games. With only two regular season games remaining, the 26-year-old remains one goal away from 70 for the season. That's a number that hasn't been reached since Alexander McGillney and Timu Solani each scored 76 goals in the 92-93 season. The Leafs face off against the Panthers tonight at 7.30. And TSN Radio's Matt Cause joined us with more on the significance of Matthews' chase for 70. There have been 12 men who have walked on the moon. There have been eight who have scored 70 goals or more in an NHL season. Not comparing the two, I'm just saying that you're watching history, and it's a really cool thing. And speaking of history, scoring 70 goals in 2024 is a lot more difficult than it was in the 80s and early 90s when the game was much more up and down, where it wasn't as defensive oriented as it is today. And the Maple Leafs are returning to the playoffs and tailgate parties are returning to Maple Leaf Square. The team says that fans can expect giveaways, special guests, as well as activations for home and away games. The Leafs faithful will also be able to watch all of the action on the big screen in the square. Tailgate party passes. They're free, but you have to book them through the Leafs app. They're going to become available at 1 p.m. the day before each game. 
And Team Canada has once again collaborated with Lululemon to design clothing athletes will wear during the upcoming Summer Olympics. Athletes will wear mostly red for the opening ceremonies in solid or tapestry prints with short shirts and jackets. On the podium, winners will wear a tracksuit style, which can have the sleeves and pant legs zipped up often features the maple leaf on the design. Now, for the closing ceremony, athletes will wear a multicolored kit, which is a collaboration with a First Nations artist and celebrates the Northern Lights and abstract nature. That's pretty cool. Thank you for watching CP24 Live at noon.